Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture on Unit 3 in our Math Basics textbook. This chapter we're going to be going over decimals. Decimals are used in every day in healthcare settings. Understanding the applications of decimals provides a strong foundation for measurement conversions, the metric system, medication dosages, and general charting work. Most medication orders and medical equipment such as syringes are often using, uh, written using the metric system, which relies on decimals. Decimals are also seen in drug labels, providing the details about the amount of a medication in metric units per tablet or per capsule. So these amounts may appear as a decimal number plus a milligram slash tablet as shown in this label here. However, not all medications are listed using numbers. So a decimal represents a part or a fraction of a whole number. Decimal numbers are parts of tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on, as we see on this number chart here. In other words, decimals are multiples of 10. The decimal point, the period, represents the boundary between the whole numbers and the decimal numbers. So let's think about the example $104.99. We understand this number to be $104 and then 99 cents of a whole dollar, right? The decimal point is the and. And if we write the number in words, Again, we see $104.99. Any number to the left of the decimal point is always going to be a whole number. That's the $104 in this case. And any numbers to the right of the decimal point is going to be the decimal number, which is $0.99 cents in this example. So with Without a whole number, a decimal number is always going to be less than 1. So we understand that 0 0.89 would, uh, and 0 0.123 are both less than 1. Healthcare workers include the 0 to the left of the decimal point for any decimal that does not include a whole number. This is really, really important. I can't say enough how important it is to make sure we have that zero in there. This is going to signal the reader that the dose or the measurement or the amount is less than one. And a zero is also going to prevent errors caused by misreading a decimal number. Note that, the, that this zero does not change the value of the number. Also, trailing zeros such as 7.190 are dropped because they serve no mathematical purpose. So we would write that as 7.19 and not 7.190. Reading decimal numbers is simple if you follow a few tips. Say the numbers from the left to the right as if they were whole numbers and then add the decimal place value. You can identify decimal numbers by looking for the words that end in TH or THS. So an example would be 42 and 125 thousandths. So how would we write a decimal in words? Here are a few examples. 3.2, we would write as 3 and 2 tenths. 5.14, we would write as 5 and 14 hundredths. It ends in the hundredths place. And 15.002, we would write as 15 and 2 thousandths because it ends in the thousandths place. So then here we can do the reverse. We can 
write the words that we read in decimals. So if we were reading 3 tenths, we would write that as 0 0.3. If we were reading 21 hundredths, we would write that as 0 0.21. And if we were writing 612 thousandths, we would write that as 0 0.612. And lastly, 612 thousandths. See that and in there. The and signifies that we have whole numbers and decimal numbers. So that would be written as 600.012. Um, and then you can check your work by uh, looking at 56 thousandths, right? You can make sure that it ends itself in the thousandths place. Decimals are rounded in healthcare sometimes to create manageable numbers. We may have a difficult time visualizing a number such as 14.38757. So it might be better for us to round that and use 14.4. Right. Uh, care has to be taken, however, not to round too much or too often when we're calculating dosages. It's best to work a problem all the way through to the end of a dosage calculation before we round the before we round it and then just round the final answer. This avoids changing the actual figures that should be used to calculate an exact dosage. So let's look at how to round decimals. First, we're going to underline the place to which we are rounding. We're going to circle the number to the right of the underlined number. Does this ring a bell? We did this with whole numbers. If the circled number is greater than 5, then we're going to add a 1 to the underlined number and drop all the other numbers to the right of the changed number. If the circled number is less than five, we're not gonna change the underlying number, but drop all the other numbers to the right of that number. Let's look at some examples. So here we have 1.75, all right? So we circled the number. Okay, we're gonna round to the tenths place. Uh, so we underlined that. And we circled the number to the right of it, which is the hundredths place. And then we ask ourselves, is it five or greater? And yes, it is. So we're going to add a one to that number that we underlined, and that's going to become 1.8. If we had a, a similar example of 1.74, and we're still rounding to the tenths place, we're going to underline the seven, and then we're going to look to the number directly to the right and circle that. That's the number we need to determine, is it five or more, or is it less than five? And in this example, it is less than five, so we're gonna leave the seven in the tens place alone, and we would write it as 1.7. All right, so let's look at this problem. This problem wants us to round 4.97 to the nearest tenth. All right, so first let's identify the tenths place and put a line under that. That would be the nine, okay? Then we're gonna look at the number to the right and we're gonna circle it, and that would be the seven. So we're gonna ask ourselves, is the seven five or greater? or is it less than five? And in this case, it's five or greater, so we're gonna round up, and we're gonna add one to the nine, which then makes 10, which is gonna bump the four to a five. So when we round this, we get 5.5. It's important to note when and which place to round to, um, General guidelines for rounding, we're going to talk more about that in Unit 12 in dosage calculation. So for right now, you'll uh, the problem will tell you uh, where you're going to round, and you'll just perform that operation accordingly. All right, so just as we 
compared whole numbers and we compared fractions, we can also compare decimals. So let's talk about the steps for comparing decimals. First, we're going to line the decimals up like buttons on a shirt. We want all of the points to be in alignment, right? This will help us make the decimal numbers appear to have the same number of decimal places. The next thing we're going to do is add zeros to fill any empty place values so that the decimals have the same number of places or digits. And then lastly, we're going to disregard the decimal point for a moment and read the numbers as they are written from left to right, including the added zero place values. So let's look at an example. So which is larger, 0 0.081 or 0 0.28? So like we said, we're going to first line up the numbers so that their decimal points are in uh, uh, in alignment, right? Then we're going to fill in any empty place values with zeros. Okay, so here you can see that they added a zero to 0 0.280, zero, just for the time being, right? So that we can um, we can keep them lined up. And so then next, we're just going to read them from left to right. All right, we have 81, and we have 280. So which one of them do you think is larger? That's right. 0 0.28 is larger than 0 0.081. So syringes are often in decimal units. Syringes measure volume and the unit of measure is typically milliliters. Now you might see some as cc's. Uh, that's um, pretty much gone by the wayside, but a cc, a cubic centimeter, and a milliliter are the same amount of measurement. So either one, uh, we're reporting the same thing, but now we typically use milliliters. So what is the measure of each of these syringes? If we look at the top syringe, we'll see the whole numbers are milliliters, 1 through 12 mLs on this syringe. And between the whole numbers, you'll see little hash marks. Each is going to be worth 0.2. So how much would be in the syringe on the top? What do you guys think? If you said 2.6 mLs, you would be right because if we start at the 2 and each little hash line is 2, it's at the third one, right? So 2, 4, 6 would be at the third one, 2.6. All right, let's look at the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom um, actually is um, going up by a tenth right? So every one is uh, increasing by one. So we start at the point four, and then we go up one, two, three, four, right? Where the arrow is, it's on the fourth hash mark. So we would say this is 0 0.44 milliliters. Definitely something that we're going to be using as surgical technologists. So to add decimals, we are first going to line up the decimal points, and then we're going to just go ahead and add them up. So this might mean that a problem presented in a horizontal pattern needs to be rewritten in a vertical pattern. A whole number always has a decimal point to the right side of the final number. Sometimes it's not written there, right? If we have 56, that's like 56 point something, all right, zero, zero, all right. So we're going to add the numbers and bring the decimal point straight down. So here's an example. Um, they're wanting us to add up 2.46, 0 0.005, and 1.3. All right, so we're going to line them up and we're going to add zeros so that we have the same amount of numbers same number of numbers, all right? And then we're just going to simply add them up. And when we do that, we get 3.765.
When we're subtracting decimals, again, same as addition, we are going to line up the decimal points. Again, it might be easier for us to write this vertically instead of horizontally. Once we line up the decimal points, then we are going to fill the empty spaces with zeros and we're going to go ahead and subtract as we normally would. And when we do that, we get an answer of 94.74. We're going to do our subtraction and then bring our decimal point straight down. Now, when we're multiplying decimals, we don't line them up, okay? Um, we are going to um, work through this problem here, and you can see that they, the numbers are right justified, okay? Like when we're multiplying whole numbers. Right, so let's work through this problem. We have 4.75 times 0.4. All right, I would feel better if there was a zero there. Um, so we're going to write justify that. We're going to write it vertically, rewrite it. It's easier for us to work it that way. And we have 4.75 times 0.4. We're going to do our multiplication. And then instead of bringing the decimal point straight down, we're going to count the decimal places of both numbers. So in this case, can you see the ones that have the squares around them? There's two numbers to the right of 4.75, and there's one number to the right of the decimal point in point 0.4. So if we add those up, we get one, two, three decimal places. So we're going to start from the far right, and we're going to move our decimal point one, two, three jumps to the left, and that is where we're going to put our decimal point, and then we can get rid of those extra zeros, and that gives us an answer of 1.9. All right, now let's look at dividing decimals. Now to divide decimals, we're going to need to place the decimal point first and then divide the numbers. Once the decimal point is placed, we don't want to move that at all. Sometimes students have a tendency to want to move the decimal point once the division process is underway, and this is going to result in an error uh, for you of the decimal placement. So the first step, the first step, we're going to move the decimal point straight up to the same place in the quotient. Okay, so here we have the problem of 2.58 divided by 6. So we've set up our problem, and we have 2.58 and we're going to move that decimal point straight up, all right? We're going to divide. Now, first, we're going to add a zero in front of all decimal numbers that do not include a whole number. So let's look at uh, our example. The first number that we're trying to divide 6 into is 2, and it doesn't go into that, right? So it goes in zero times. So we're going to put a zero there, all right? And we're, then we're going to look at 25. Does 6 go into 25? Yes, it does, 4 times. 4 times 6 is 24. We're going to do our subtraction. We get 1. We're going to bring our 8 straight down. And then we're going to ask ourselves, how many times does 6 go into 18? It goes in 3 times, so we're going to put our 3 up there. We're going to do 6 times 3. That equals 18. We subtract it out. We get 0. So our final answer is going to be 0 0.43. So healthcare students may need some practice in dividing decimals that involve zeros in the quotient. This is one area where I see errors commonly being made. So to avoid these errors, recall that after you've brought down a number from the dividend, you must apply the divisor to that number, right? Place the decimal point and then divide the number. If the divisor does not go into that dividend, then you need to put a zero in the quotient. Use a zero to hold that space. 
So here we have an example that illustrates that. We have 33.67 divided by 14, and we've set that up here. We've brought our decimal point straight up and placed it before we start. And then we're gonna look at the first number, three. Does 14 go into three? No, it does not. If you wanna put a zero there, you can, and we can take it out later, but you don't need to uh, if you don't want to. So then let's ask ourselves, does 14 go into 33? Well, yes it does, it goes twice. So we're gonna put the two above the second three. We're gonna multiply 14 times two, and that gives us 28. And then we're gonna subtract 28 from 33, and that gives us five. All right, then we're gonna bring our six straight down, and now we're going to determine how many times 14 goes into 56, and it goes in four times perfectly. All right, so that when we do 56 minus 56, that gives us a zero. How many times does 14, or we bring our seven down, and then we have to ask how many times does 14 go into seven? Well, it doesn't, it goes zero times. So we put, put a zero, we multiply 14 times zero, which gives us a zero. We do our subtraction and we get seven left and we bring our zero down and then we have to determine how many times does 14 go into 70 and it goes in five times. 14 times five is going to be 70 and then that leaves us with zero left when we do our subtraction. So now we have our answer of 2.405. So what if we're dividing a decimal by a decimal? Let's talk about the steps, all right? To divide a decimal number by a decimal number, we are going to change the divisor, the number that we are dividing by, to a whole number by moving the decimal point to the right, however many times we need to, to make it a whole number. When we do this, we have to move the decimal point in the dividend, what we are dividing into, the same number of places to the right. We're gonna use zeros as placeholders if we need to. So then we're gonna place the decimal point above the quotient and divide using the same process that we've already discussed. So let's look at that. So here's our problem. 0.6216 divided by 0.42. All right, so we're dividing by 0.42 and that's a decimal and we need to turn it into a whole number, right? So what we decided we would do is we're gonna move the decimal point two jumps to the right to make it a whole number, which gives us 42. Well, now we have to do the same thing to the 0 0.6216. So we're gonna move it to the right two places, which gives us 62.16. Now we can go ahead and set that up, 42 divided by 62.16. We're gonna move our decimal point up uh, and put it in the same place. And then we're going to work through our division problem like normal. We'll ask ourselves, does 42 go into six? No, it does not. So we're going to ask ourselves, does 42 go into 62? And yes, it does, it goes once. So we're gonna put our one up there above the two. We'll do our subtraction and we get 20 left. And we're gonna bring down our, um, our one and then we have 201. So how many times does 42 go into 201? About four times. All right, and so that's going to give us 168, and we're gonna subtract that from 201, which gives us 33 left. We're gonna bring our six down. 42 goes into 336 eight times uh, perfectly, and so that will give us our answer of 1.48. So using uh, shortcuts of simplified multiplication and division can save us some time when we're working with decimals. Some simplified multiplication and division problems use units of 10 to either multiply or divide. The reason they are simplified is that the decimal place is modified by moving the decimal right for multiplication 
and left for division. Remember, when we multiply something by something, the number is going to get bigger. When we divide something into something, our answer is going to get smaller, all right? So it makes sense that when we're multiplying, we would move the decimal point to the right to give us a bigger number. But when we're dividing, we're gonna move it to the left to give us a smaller number. In healthcare fields, this shortcut is important to your work in metrics and in efficiently working longer problems. So let's talk about the process. This shortcut works only with multiples of 10. 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, etc., etc. The process should be pretty straightforward. To multiply, move the decimal point to the right. To divide, move the decimal point to the left. The number of spaces you move the decimal point depends on which multiple you're working with. Make sure that you look at the number of zeros included in the multiple. Then you are going to move the decimal in either direction depending on the operation. For both multiplication and division, be sure to use the correct number of spaces and number of zeros. So let's see how this works with some examples. Here, we're multiplying by 10 in this first one. So in that case, we're multiplying and we have one zero, so we're going to move right one place, right? So 4.5 times 10 is 45, right? We didn't really even have to use a calculator or do any long multiplication. We just saw that there was one zero and we're multiplying, so that means we're going to move the decimal plate one place to the right. If we're multiplying by 100, how many zeros are in 100? That's right, there's two. So we're gonna move the decimal place two places to the right. So 14.23 times 100 becomes 1,423. To multiply by 1,000, we're gonna locate the decimal point and move it to the right by three places. There's three zeros. We're gonna move it to the right three places. So 0 0.476 multiplied by 1,000 is going to give us 476. Remember to use zeros as placeholders if you need more digits. So for example, if we have 74.28 times 1,000, we need to move our decimal point three places, but there's only two numbers. So we're going to have to end up adding a zero, which gives us 74,280. So here we're going to use simplified um, division. We talked about multiplication, so now we're gonna look at division. If we're dividing by 10, remember we're going to look at how many zeros, and now we're going to shift our decimal point to the left, right? One zero, shift one space to the left, and now we get 0 0.45. All right, important to put your zero if there is not a whole number before the decimal point. All right, if we're dividing by 100, how many zeros are there? There's two, right? So we're going to move the decimal point two places to the left. And if we're looking at 14.23 divided by 100, then we're going to move two jumps to the left, which gives us zero 0.1423. Similarly, if we're dividing by a thousand, that's three zeros. We're going to move three places to the left. And here's an example, 476 divided by 1000. We're going to move our decimal point three places to the left. That's going to give us 0 0.476. Remember to use zeros for placeholders if you need them, all right? So in the example, 74.28 divided by 1,000, we need to move our decimal place three places because there are three zeros, but there are only two digits to the left 
of the decimal point. So we're going to need to add a zero. So when we make those movements, we add the zero, and our correct answer would be 0 0.07428. So it's important to be able to convert between number systems so that you're comfortable with comparing sizes of items or quantities of supplies, let's say. Changing decimals to fractions requires the use of decimal places and placing the numbers in fractions that represent the very same numbers. All right, so here we have an example of converting 0 0.457 to a fraction. Again, we're going to count the places. All right, we're going to count the places uh, to the right of the decimal point, and there are three of them, right? Three means the thousands. So we are going to set the numerator as a whole number, 4 uh, 457, excuse me, over 1,000, a one and three zeros, right? Because there were three places to the right of the decimal point. This means that if we had a pizza, let's say it was a very big pizza, and we chopped it up into a thousand pieces, and we fed it to an army, maybe the army only ate 457 pieces of the entire pizza, okay? Let's look at another example. Here, we wanna convert 2.75 to a fraction. So reserve the whole number two until the end. Don't think about that right now, just set that aside, all right? We're just gonna deal with the 0.75. So how many places are we working with to the right of the decimal? If you said two, you're absolutely right. So we're gonna write that over a one with two zeros, right? Because that's the hundredths place. So 57 one hundredths. And we can actually reduce that down to three quarters, right? Because 25 will go into 75 and 100. 25 goes into 75 three times, and 25 goes into 100 four times. So we also need to always think about reducing when we're working with fractions. So here we reduced 75 one hundredths to three quarters, and now we're just going to assemble our number back together, and we get two and three quarters. So to change fractions to decimals, we're going to divide the numerator, uh, the denominator, excuse me, into the numerator. We're going to divide the bottom number into the top number. Critical to success of this division is the placement of the decimal point, all right? Once it is placed, don't move it. Right? This process is also best seen with an example. So let's look at an example. Here we're converting three quarters to a decimal point. Add two place holder zeros to the right of the three. Place the decimal point in the quotient. Divide the denominator into the numerator by performing long division. And that gives us the answer of 0.75. Okay. So here's an interesting example. Here they're wanting us to convert one third to a decimal. So what we'll do is place the decimal point, divide three into one. We're gonna add zeros as needed to continue the division. The division may not come out evenly, but begin to repeat itself. So in this Situation, we get 0 0.3333333333 on for forever and forever and always, all right? So after two places, if it's continuing to repeat, 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 make the remainder into a fraction by putting the remaining number over the divisor. So here, uh, we would, when we're converting one third to a decimal, we would write it as 0 0.33 and one third.
In some instances, you're going to need to make temperature conversions that include decimals. So to perform these conversions, you're going to round the decimal numbers in the temperatures to the nearest tenth place, right? That's one place to the right of the decimal. So the temperature conversions you reviewed in Unit 2 relied on fractions. The same fraction method can be converted into a decimal method. In deciding which method to use, select the method of fractions or decimals based on your stronger skill. Then consistently use that uh, conversion formula. So here are the two formulas. To convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, uh, we have C times 1.8 plus 32, and then to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, we have F minus 32 divided by 1.8. So let's look at a problem. So here we have 41 degrees Celsius, and we want to find out what the Fahrenheit is. So we're going to choose the formula where um, we know, uh, so we can plug in Celsius, right? So we're going to plug in the 41 for the C variable, and that is going to give us 41 times 1.8 plus 32. Now remember there's those pesky parentheses and we have to take care of the operations within the parentheses first. So when we multiply 41 times 1.8, we get 73.8 and then we simply add the 32, and this is going to give us 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's look at the reverse. Let's say we know the Fahrenheit and we want to find the Celsius. So 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit equals how many degrees Celsius? So we're gonna plug in the 107.6 into the formula, and we're going to take care of those operations within the formula, within the parentheses first. So 107.6 minus 32, that gives us 75.6. And then we're going to divide that by 1.8. And when we work that out, we get 42 degrees Celsius. Now what about mixed fractions and decimals? Well, sometimes problems will include both fractions and decimals. Doesn't that sound fun? Well, the very same process of solving the problems are still needed. However, the order of handling the parts of the problem might vary. So we're going to group the math computations inside the problem to best manage the separate operations. If the problem has a complex fraction, multiplied by a decimal number, work the complex fraction first, then complete the decimal multiplication. So let's look at an example. Here we have one half divided by one fifth times 2.2. All right, so here we're going to reciprocal right? Reciprocal because we're dividing. So one half divided by one fifth, right, is one half over five over one, right, which gives us five halves, right? Five halves. And then we can turn that into a mixed number and then into a fraction. So five halves, two goes into five two times, and that leaves one left over, so that is two and a half. And then two and a half is 2.5. We would divide two into one, that would give us 0.5, and then we add our whole number. 2.5. Now it's really easy. We can go ahead and do our multiplication. So calculating decimals in word problems. Let's use what we've learned about decimals to solve the following word problems. 
Right, so the first one is Dr. Brown prescribed a medication dosage of 4.5 grams. How many 1.5 grams tablets need to be administered? So how would you figure this out? Dr. Brown prescribed a medication dosage of 4.5 and the dosage is 1.5. So this is just a simple division problem and we get three tablets. The second one is the dietitian serves a protein dish at three meals. If the total daily grams of protein are 33.39 grams, that's a day, what is the average meals grams of protein? Assuming that the grams are divided evenly. So here is a division problem, right? So we would divide 33.39 divided by three, and that's gonna give us roughly 11.13 grams. The last example is Larry is working in the storeroom moving boxes of medical supplies and each box weighs 10.4 pounds. There are 24 boxes in a carton. So how many pounds would a carton of medical supplies weigh? So here is a multiplication problem. And when you multiply it out, you should get 249.6 pounds. So now let's look at these scales. Can you convert these digital scale weights to fractions? So let's look at the first one. The first one is 12.6, all right? When we work that out, we are going to get 12 and 3 fifths, all right? The second one, we have 33.8, all right? Now, if we have 33.8, right, we're gonna set the whole number aside, and then we're going to put the eight over 10, right? Because it's one, number, we're gonna set that over 10, and then we can reduce that down, right? Two will go into to eight, and two will go into 10. So two goes into eight four times, two goes into 10 five times, so that leaves us with 33 and four fifths. Now let's look at the next one. We have 98.2 pounds. So we're gonna set the 98 to the side, we're gonna set two over 10, right? Because two is just to the tenths place. So two will go into to itself once, two will go into 10 five times, and, and then we reassemble our fraction and that gives us 98 and one fifth pounds. All right, so 222.4 and 46.5 can um, both be figured out in the same way. So take a second and pause the lecture and see if you can figure these out. All right, so we've successfully covered decimals. Now we're going to shift gears a smidge and look at the metric system. So unit four in our math basics textbook is going to cover the metric system. So metric measurements are used for many different types of measurements in the healthcare profession. Some uses include the following, weight calculations, dosage calculations, food intake measurement, height and length measurements, and liquid and medication measurements. So here are some examples of metric measurements that are used in healthcare and the syringe is a really common one that we'll be using as a surgical technologist along with basins, graduates, med cups, and the like. 
So let's look at some basic units. So metric units come in base units, and these units measure different types of materials. Measurement types include volume, weight, and length. Here we see some examples of various measurements. A liter is for volume and measures liquid. A gram is for weight and measures uh, weight or amount. And a meter is for length and measures height, length, uh, and instruments. The metric system uses units based on multiples of 10, and so that's a really easy conversion for us. Uh, for this reason, metric numbers are written in whole numbers or decimal numbers, but never as fractions. You can solve metric conversion problems by moving the decimal either to the left or to the right, like we practiced in the last unit. So if you're moving from grams to milligrams, you must move the decimal point three places to the right. This is the same as multiplying the number by a thousand. So 1.5 grams times 1,000 equals 1,500 milligrams. The um, XXs are placeholders, right? Well, they stand for the units that are not used in healthcare math. So this table shows the different units, their values, their symbols, and a mnemonic device for remembering their order. Use a mnemonic device and that will help you keep the metric units in the correct sequence or order. So perhaps you can try something silly like kiss hairy dogs but drink chocolate milk, mom. Knowing a device like this will help you remember the order of units for an exam. Note that the letters M-O and MOM are placeholders. They help you remember to count three spaces from milli to micro. The M-O of MOM is similar to the XX used in, um, that we talked about in the previous slide, and these are placeholders. So remember, kiss hairy dogs but drink chocolate milk mom, okay? You can use the first letters of the metric unit to recall their order by writing them on a piece of scratch paper or an answer sheet on exam days. The metric system combines prefixes or word parts that come first with root words, the base unit. Together, the prefix and the root indicate the type of measurement, as in volume, weight or length. For example, in the word kilogram, kilo is the prefix that means thousand and gram is the root and means weight. Centi is the prefix and means hundredth and meter is the root that indicates length. The prefixes are the key to deciphering what number of units you have. Every metric prefix may be combined with every root word. The application of these terms depends on the measure being conveyed. Thus, liquids are measured in liters and dry medications are measured in grams because this type of medication is always measured by weight. So every metric prefix may be combined with every root word, like we said before. The application of these terms depends on the measurement being conveyed. Thus, liquids are measured in liters and dry medications are measured in grams because this type of medication would be measured by weight. Now, healthcare workers will see mg for milligram and g for gram depending on the amount of medication that is being prescribed. Prefixes are not used alone. These attach to the root as seen in ml for milliliter or cc for, cent for centimeter. Cc is now used for measurement of items, not for labels on syringes as previously. These changes have occurred to ensure patient safety and clarity for healthcare workers. 
Writing metric notation correctly is important to avoid making medical errors. <clears throat> we add a leading zero before a decimal number that does not include a whole number, so we write 0 0.65 milligrams, not 0 0.65 milligrams. Furthermore, the non-essential trailing zeros are also dropped. So 1.500 grams becomes 1.5 grams because the trailing zeros don't add any value. The placement of the decimal is the key to the value of a number in the metric system. 1.5 grams is not 1,500 grams. Let's practice adding leading zeros and deleting trailing zeros. Which of these problems is incorrect? All right, let's look at that. <clears throat> 4.80 milligrams. Did you say correct or incorrect? It would be incorrect. It should be 4.8 milligrams, right? We don't need the zero at the end. Well, let's look at the next one. 0.35 grams, correct or incorrect? It's incorrect, right? It should be 0 0.35 grams. What about the next one, 1.09 liters? Is this correct? Or incorrect? That is actually correct. Let's look at the second to last one, 0.9 liters. Is this one correct or incorrect? It is incorrect. It should be 0 0.9 liters. Lastly, 90.059 grams. Is this correct or incorrect? It is correct. In healthcare, Sometimes a doctor's orders come in micrograms, but your supply on hand might come in milligrams. You need to convert from micrograms to milligrams to ensure accurate dosing. To change units within the metric system, count the spaces from the number you are starting with to the unit you are converting to. You'll either go left or right. Note that the M and O in mom, remember our mnemonic that we used, are placeholders and hold no value. They are included only to help you remember to count three spaces from milli to micro. Okay, so here's our problem. We have 45.5 grams and we want to convert that to milligrams. So, we're going to move the decimal three places to the right. Thus, 45.5 grams becomes 45,500 milligrams. Note that most healthcare conversions are done between kilogram and gram, gram and milligram, milligram and microgram, and meter and centimeter, and liter and milliliter. Don't worry, with practice, you will discover that converting between units begins to feel pretty natural. Practice making the conversion by moving the decimal from one unit to another. Use a pencil to draw a U as you count the spaces or a little jump, right? Start at the existing decimal and move to the right or left of each metric unit. Remember that the B in the, in the mnemonic stands for the base units of meters, liters, or grams. So here's another example. 50 milliliters equals how many liters? Well, we write 50 adding the implied decimal point after the zero in 50, and now we count the spaces between liters and milliliters, which is three spaces. So we're gonna move the decimal point three spaces to the left from milliliters to the base liters. We have to add some zeros for placeholders. So 50 milliliters becomes 0 0.05 liters. Of interest is that on syringes, as in the above graphic, the measurements do not include the leading zero. Syringes show units in 0.1 mLs, 0.2 mLs, 0.3 mLs, and so on. This requires a healthcare worker to read the syringes carefully to ensure accuracy. 
So here we're going to get a little bit of practice changing unit measures. So remember our mnemonic device that we learned and that was kiss hairy dogs but drink chocolate milk mom. Now remember the M and the O uh, near the tail end of there are just placeholders between the milli and the micro. Okay, so here we go and if you want to pause this video lecture as we go through these uh, before I reveal the answer just to see um, if you uh, have this down. So maybe pause it now and write in these unit measures and then um, play the video to see how you're doing. So the first one we're going to look at is 120 grams equals blank milligrams. And I'm going to see if I can get out my pen for you. One second here. And we're going to practice um, changing these units. So 120 milligrams, or 120 grams, excuse me. First we're gonna find the base, right? And that's right here. And then we're gonna determine where milligrams are, all right? And remember, that's going to be right here, okay? So now we only have to worry about moving our decimal point. Remember, the decimal point at 120 grams is right here at the end, okay, of the 120. <clears throat> so here we go. We're going to go from base, and we're going to go 1, 2, 3, right? And so that tells us we're going to move our decimal point in the same direction three times. And when we do that, that is going to give us our answer of 120 milligrams. All right, let's try the next one. The next one is 4.25 kilograms. So I'm going to do this one on the top. So here's the kilograms right here. And we're going to move to grams, which is the base right here, right? So now all we have to do is count how many times we're going to move our decimal point. And we're going to go one, two, three. We're going to move it three times to the right. And when we do that with this decimal point of the 4.25, one, two, three, right? What does that give us? That gives us 4,250 grams, right? All right, let's try the next one. The next one, um, we are wanting to figure out grams and we have micrograms, right? So remember um, down here, hold on, let me see if I can get a different color pen now for the, for the next two. Okay, so all the way down here is our micrograms and we're going to go to grams, which is the base, all the way down here. All right, so let's count how many times we're going to move our decimal point. Remember, on this 1,000, the decimal point is at the end here, okay? So we're going to move to the left now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six places to the left. All right, and if we do the same thing with our micrograms, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's where our point's gonna go. So let's see what that looks like. And that gives us 0 0.001 gram is equivalent to 1,000 micrograms. We only have one more to go. We have 34. Uh, 358.6 grams and we are wanting to convert that to kilograms. So again, uh, we're starting at the base, I'll underline that in blue, starting at the base, uh, which is grams, and we're going to kilograms. So we're going to move that to the left and kilograms is right over here. So we're going to go one, two, three movements of the decimal point to the left, and if we come down here to our grams and we do the same, one, two, three, that's where the decimal point's gonna go, 
right? And so that gives us 0 0.3586. Now remember, it's very important to put this zero on the front of each of these answers, all right? That um, provides clarity and it also reduces the, the risk of error, okay? All right, so here we have a little word problem. The medical assistant was asked to measure an infant, right? The infant measured 0 0.4453 meters or how many centimeters? All right, now it's a good time to pause the video lecture and work through this yourself and then come back and work, we'll work through the answer. Okay, so again, I'm gonna get my pen out here so we can work through this. All right, so we have meters, right? Where is meters? Meters is, remember, going to be our base, right? Meters is going to be our base. It's right here, okay? And we're going where? We're going to centimeters, okay? So we are going to, from the decimal point, move to the right. One, two times, to the right. And if we come down here and we do the same thing with this little decimal point, one, two times, to the right, it's gonna be right there, so then, we get our, let me see if I can write it with, I'm trying to perfect my skills here of writing with my pen. Five, three, so 44.53 centimeters. Let's work through one last word problem, and this one, we uh, have a drug label that notes that the client's medicine has 250 milligrams of medication in five milliliters of syrup. And we want to know how many milliliters would deliver 125 milligrams of medicine. Now, intuitively, you might look at this and say, okay, we have 250 milligrams of medicine in five milliliters. 125 milligrams is half of 250. So half of five milliliters would be 2.5, right? And you can intuitively see that. Um, the math that corresponds to that, we're gonna set this equation up um, as a conversion, right? So um, if you look here at this top line, again, let me get my pen out one second. We have <clears throat> 250 milligrams over five milliliters. So this is 250 milligrams of medicine per five milliliters. Now we want to set up an equivalent equation on the other side, right? So we know that we're wanting 125 milligrams. So remember milligrams and milligrams, they need to be on the same um, uh, side as the, on the same side of the line um, with each other. So we're going to set them both as the numerator. And then underneath that, uh, 125 milligrams is what we're looking for, right? How many milliliters? We don't know, okay? So when we set this up, that we can go ahead and cross multiply. And when we do that, we get 250 milligrams X because we multiply the 250 times the X. And then we're gonna multiply the 125 by the five, and that gives us 625. Now, we have to get x by itself to be able to solve this. So the way that we would do this is we would divide both sides by 250 milligrams, right? What you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other. 
So we're going to divide both sides by 250 milligrams X, right? And so when we do that, then this 250 goes away, right? And we are left with X equals 205 milliliters, right? Because we're going to take this on this side of the equation, this 250, and we're going to divide it up into 625, and that goes two and a half times. And so in uh, equation speak, this is how we would get to our answer if we can't intuitively see, because sometimes the, the, equa the equation is going to be more difficult and we're not going to be able to intuitively see. And we'll talk more about proportions later on in another chapter, um, but this is how you would set this up. All right, so that concludes our lecture on chapters three and four. I hope that you found it helpful, and I look forward to seeing you all in class. Thank you very much.